thank you that you you're a speaking God and you speak to us you love us you've given us your word we pray Lord that you would open our eyes to see wonderful things from your word this evening uh, and not just to see them not just to understand them but to take them to heart to allow the things that we hear Lord to shape the way that we think uh, the way that we live uh, Father please do open our eyes Please do help us by your spirit this evening. We ask this in your name. Amen. Well, uh, at very short notice, uh, we're going to, we're going to um, have a sermon on uh, Matthew chapter 20. Now, Tiago has been has taken ill, but I, I realized as I was thinking, what do I do about that when I discovered it this afternoon, uh, that this morning you may well have felt, and a, and a lot of people came up to me to say how much they'd felt the, the kind of gut blow of the law of God just hitting us as we looked at the fact that our anger is murder in the heart. What a shocking reality that is to come face to face with our, with our sin. And so having felt and um, being hit by the law, I'd like us this evening to just feel the balm of God's grace as we look at this parable together. So let's look at that now. Well, Jesus used many parables, and he used them, if you look at them, to tell us, on the whole, something about what Jesus called the kingdom of God. It's what he was preaching. It's the theme of his preaching everywhere he went. And this one's no exception. This parable is a story teaching a lesson about grace, and grace, as one author puts it, is the economy of God's kingdom. Grace is the economy of God's kingdom. Now, at the risk of oversimplifying, the phrase then, the kingdom of God, basically means the reign of God, and the reign of God creates a people and a realm over which God rules. That's all we're talking about. To belong to the kingdom means you belong to God. It means that Jesus Christ is, his, is, your, is your king. And it's a citizenship that brings us great privilege and blessing. Members of this kingdom are those who, if you want to again put it crudely, are, are going to heaven. You're heaven bound if you're in the kingdom. They belong to God, you're his. Now the issue underlying this short story we just had read to us is qualifications to enter God's kingdom. And not just how do I qualify, but also the issue of how well qualified am, am I? Are there, in fact, actually some who are more worthy, uh, worthy of greater recognition maybe in the kingdom or, or a bigger reward, presumably, you know, for services rendered in this life that are kind of special? Who is greater? Who is lesser in God's kingdom? Who has the most right to citizenship? Are there some that even, you might say, have a, have a special position in God's kingdom. Now, you might be aware that for some reason, Jesus's disciples were very concerned about this issue. I mean, anyone who's read through the gospel, you, you'll, have, you'll have noticed this. They like to argue about this particular issue. And just over the page, so in, uh, in Matthew chapter 18, you've actually got, um, you've got them asking Jesus, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? They want to know it. And this is the point. What does Jesus do in response to that question? He takes a child. He stands a child in front of them and tells us it's the one who takes the lowly position of a child who is great in his kingdom. Now, that's a bit of a head scratcher, isn't it? They're left scratching their heads. And to make things worse, actually, shortly afterwards, so in the very next chapter, chapter 19, if you've got your Bibles open, you've got a very impressive young man who comes to Jesus, and he's a law keeper, he's good at keeping the law, and he's wealthy, and he's interested in spiritual things. I mean, that's pretty good, isn't it? But he is, we find out, he is too attracted to his wealth, so attracted to his wealth that he rejects Jesus. And Jesus says, listen, it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a man like that to enter the kingdom of heaven let alone have any status in that kingdom. Now, by the way, when Jesus says that, can I just point out that passing a camel through the eye of a needle is impossible. It's not just difficult. Okay, I know people like to talk about some kind of 
narrow gate in Jerusalem. That's not the point. You've missed the point. It's harder, says Jesus, for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God than it is to do that, to get a camel through the eye of a needle. That means, what is Jesus saying? He says it's harder than impossible. And when the dismayed ask, uh, disciples ask him, well, who then can be saved? I mean, that's the response of people who've got what Jesus is saying, haven't they? Jesus tells them, verse 26, well, with man, this is impossible. You're right. But with God, all things are possible. That's a hint as to where we're going. You see, left to ourselves, that is, using our own efforts, and we were seeing this in the mornings, aren't we? No one can be saved. You don't want to dig deep and look in here for salvation. Entering God's kingdom is only possible if God himself steps in and does it for us. None of us can come close enough to being good enough for heaven. But the disciples, let's get their background as to what's going on here. They don't want to let the issue drop. They can't take it, you know, even after this, this rich man's been there. In verse 27, look at the end of that story. Peter blurts out, you know, Jesus, we have left everything to follow you. What then will there be for us? Now, what we're looking at here is evidently then a very hard lesson to learn. It's very hard to learn. In fact, even after Jesus tells this parable, which goes away to trying to teach the right attitude to this. Look at, look at the end of it, uh, of the chapter, chapter 20, verse 20. Look, you've got, what's the next story there? James and John, what are they doing? They get their mum to come and ask Jesus for the best seats in the kingdom. You know, it's how they're thinking. Surely there's some kind of hierarchy in the kingdom. Surely our efforts now, surely we can get a step up, a foot up in the kingdom of heaven. It's got to count for something. I mean, we, we think this, I mean, don't you think this way? Surely we have our, our, our Christian heroes, don't we, that we think, yes, yeah, surely they are more worthy than us. Surely, you know, when I was growing up, you know, the books of Corrie Ten Boom or, or Brother Andrew, God Smuggler, or Jim Elliot giving his life in Ecuador, you know, these, these wonderful missionary stories, surely the red carpet is rolled out for them more so than it is for me. Surely they've got a status somehow. We, we give them status even here, don't we? But Jesus says that the economy of his kingdom is different. His, look at verse 16, really intriguing this. His is a kingdom where the last will be first and the first will be last. In fact, interestingly, just to get the setting here right, that summary there, that sentence, bookends this parable on both sides. It's the last verse in chapter 19 as well. Look at verse, uh, verse 30 of chapter 19. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. What does that mean? How does that work? I mean, it sounds like a riddle, doesn't it? Well, the answer for those with ears to hear it, is found in this very parable that we're looking at this evening. So let's take a look at it. Verse 1. Jesus says, The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. So Jesus is painting a very familiar picture in Palestine. A landowner goes to employ workers for his vineyard. It's harvest time. There's lots of work to be done. And there's a sudden rush on. Everyone wants workers for the harvest, right? He's going to try and get all the help that he can. And most of us think nine to five is, you know, that's a good day's work. But people in Jesus' day, they're working a solid 12-hour day. You've got to get that for the, the way this parable works. And especially unskilled laborers. So this man heads down to the marketplace, the center of town, where you're going to get people loitering around, waiting for someone to come and employ them. And he's down there at the crack of dawn. He's down there at 6 a.m. And he's going to recruit as many laborers as he can, right at the beginning of the day. And he's offering a really generous wage. He's offering a full denarius. That's a very good wage. So apparently... Uh, a professional Roman soldier of this period would take home 225 denarii per day. That's a good salary. 
So for unskilled laborers, this is top pay. This is good, isn't it? This is above minimum wage. This is a really good wage. So they're very happy. I mean, everyone he makes this deal with, they're going to go and work. They can't believe their luck. This is generous. But now the plot thickens. The landowner, Jesus tells us, returns to the marketplace at 9 a.m. and then at 12 at noon. And then he comes back at 3 p.m. And then one final time, he goes back down to the marketplace at 5 p.m. One hour before knocking off time. And each time, he recruits anyone that he finds standing idle in, in the marketplace there, and he brings them to work in his vineyard. And don't miss the detail in verse 4. Look, he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I will pay, pay you whatever is right. So with each subsequent group, no wage has been set, just what is right. He says, I'll pay you what's right. And they go to work. Why? Because daylight's burning. They've sat around and achieved nothing with their day so far. And even earning a few pennies, which is probably all they expect, especially the later ones, is better than having no work at all. You, you want to come home with something to show for your day. So they're not expecting much, just, just something. And the working day then ends, and the owner of the vineyard says to his foreman, Call the workers and pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired and going on to the first. And then the landowner stands back to oversee his foreman, paying the workers in turn, starting with the last first. Is this ringing some bells? Starting with the last first. So the latecomers, it's a brilliant story, this. Those that, kept the, the, you know, the, the five o'clock crew, they pitch up at the front of the queue. And they're probably not expecting much. They've done maybe an hour's work. I mean, probably less if we're being honest. You know, let's get into the story a bit, shall we? After walking to the vineyard, after getting the tools out, figuring out what you're doing, I mean, they've achieved little more than showing up, haven't they, really? But here's the first shock then. The foreman hands over a full denarius, full wage. A generous 12-hour pay just for showing up. I mean, they've barely, they're barely turned up. They've got a full pay packet as they go home. Now, at this point, of course, I suspect that those who've done a full day's labor, they're starting to salivate, don't you? If those guys just got a full denarius for one hour's work, quick mental maths, you, you can picture yourself, can't you? Do the maths, do the maths. Are we going to get 12? What's going to be our reward? It's going to be a good reward, surely. But no, here's the second shock. Every worker, regardless of the hours that they've put in, is paid the same wage. Same wage across the board. And, it, and I guess it's funny because a denarius sounded so good at the start of the day, so generous. But now it seems quite disappointing to those workers that started at the crack of dawn. And so we read, look, verse 12, those who were first employed in the group, they start grumbling. These who were hired last worked only one hour, they said. You've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day. Now, it sounds like a fair point, doesn't it? I mean, you'd phone your union up on this one, wouldn't you? Is the landowner being unfair? That's the accusation being made, isn't it? Well, the landowner gets wind of it. He knows what's being said, and he comes over to reason with them. A and I don't think we're supposed to see him as being angry here. He's, he's simply come up to reason with them because he wants them to know that there's been no unfairness. Look at verse 13. He answered one of them, I'm not being unfair to you, friend, he says. Friend, I'm not being unfair. Didn't you agree to work for a denarius? Take your pay and go. I'm not being unfair to you, he says. We had an agreement. You agreed 
to a denarius. That's exactly what I've paid you. You've, you've received a good wage for unskilled labor for a day's work. And then he continues, look, verse 14. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave to you. Don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? Or are you envious because I am generous? As the landowner, as the one who owns everything, he has the right to express his generosity, doesn't he? There's nothing unfair in being generous to those he wants to be generous to. The ones at fault are the ones who have started to envy. Now, the, the literal translation of that last question in verse 15 is actually, you know, is, is more like this. Is your eye evil because I am good? That's literally what, what the text is saying. Has your eye become evil? The evil eye, you see, is the eye that is full of jealousy. It's the green eye, isn't it, as we call it? The eye full of, gener uh, of jealousy. Generosity, you see, is a really good thing, isn't it? Don't we love to see... Well, we love it when it's done to us, sure. But, but generosity is a good thing, isn't it? It's a beautiful thing. And so the master asks them, look, has my generosity, my goodness, caused your eye to sin? Are you started looking evilly at other people? Has my kindness caused your heart to be filled with envy? See, all the workers have been shown generosity. They've all been shown generosity. In fact, all of them have got better than they deserved. But they had no real prospects at the beginning of the day. But these are angry simply because others have been treated with even more generosity than they have. That's what's going on. They couldn't stand the thought that other workers were getting the same pay without working as hard as them. It's a very human thing, isn't it, to think that way? And they become bitter because of it. Meanwhile, you know, if you pan the camera over to the other bit of, you know, where the people are being paid, and you, 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 you start to look at the 11th hour workers, well, they're over the moon, aren't they? <laughs> They just cannot believe what's happened. They know. Why are they so happy? They know they're unworthy of what they've just received. And that gives them joy. It reminds us of Jesus' words to Simon the Pharisee. Do you remember that, that story? It's in Luke chapter 7. Simon the Pharisee has a dinner party. He invites Jesus to come to it. Uh, and while they're at the dinner party, and Simon's all judgy about Jesus... And this woman comes in, a woman notorious. Everyone knows she's a sinner. And she washes Jesus' feet with her tears and wipes them with her hair. And Simon is disgusted. He's disgusted by what? By the grace that Jesus is showing to a sinful woman who's gatecrashed this party. And so reading his heart, Jesus says to Simon, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven, as her great love has shown. But he who has been forgiven little, loves little. See, the 11th hour workers, they are blown away. As they've received their denarius, they're left with a deep appreciation and a profound understanding of the grace of the landowner. Now, this parable is a picture, it's a parallel, it's essentially what, uh, what parable means, to teach us what the kingdom of heaven is like. This is how God treats those who come into his kingdom. So in case you've missed it, let me decode it for you. The landowner is a picture of God. The vineyard is his kingdom. It's all of those who live under his rule. And so the laborers then, all of them, even the grumblers, are believers. Those who have come into his service, working in his vineyard. The day of work is their lifetime. And the evening, the twelfth hour, pay time, that marks the start of eternity. The steward then is a picture of Jesus the one who has been given all judgment and the denarius, the wage given regardless of the hours of their labor, 
that is eternal life. Eternal life. And like the landowner then, God comes down into the marketplace of this world and he calls people to come into his generous employment. Come be my workers. He seeks out people in every age who are, who are living for nothing. Nothing of eternal value. Their lives just ebbing away, pursuing the treasures of this world that perish and spoil and fade. And he calls them and says, hey, come. Come work in my kingdom. Come be fishers of men. Be my disciples. Work for an inheritance that cannot perish, spoil or fade. And some are called early in their lives, aren't they? Perhaps that was you. Some are called so early in their life they can't look and barely even remember the day it happened. They just know that they belong to him. They know that they're his. And some are called on their deathbeds. And everything in between. When I preached this parable, uh, a funeral of a man who'd come to faith only weeks uh, before he died and felt actually kind of guilty <laughs> for the grace that God had shown him. But listen, in every case, make no mistake, they came into his kingdom because of his generosity, his undeserved favor, his grace. And that is the big point of this story. There's none that deserve it. You know, if, if, if you or I sent our CVs to God, yeah, it would be laughable, wouldn't it? There's not going to be anything written on there that could remotely impress God. You know, Andy's a good bloke. He's got himself an education. He's got some letters after his name, you know, BSc, Bronze Swimming Certificate, all of that stuff. He's trained as a teacher. He's very practical. If you, car, if you get a you problem with your car, go see Andy. He's good. He's friendly. He's punctual. All of these lovely things I can put down on my little CV. It's laughable, isn't it? Even the great apostle Paul, we, we've looked at this recently, haven't we? You know, he, he writes a large part of the New Testament. He is like the Hebrew of Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees. And after uh, reciting his impressive CV of achievements to, to the letter, in the letter to the Philippians, what does he say? I consider it garb I consider all of this garbage, he says. If God is selecting recruits, if he is employing workers, it is only, and I don't care who you are, it's only going to be by grace that he does that. And not only that, but the wage they receive bears no relation to the work that they do for him. Do you see that in this story? There's no relation to it. The Bible repeatedly declares the absolute folly, doesn't it, of boasting in ourselves, in who we are or what we've done, as if that affects in any way our salvation or our status before God. And this parable illustrates that same issue, that salvation is all of grace. But here we are actually warned of, a, of another danger, aren't we? Perhaps actually another facet of pride, and that is envy. It is the danger of developing an evil eye. You know, do you ever look at how God has blessed others? Do you ever look at around uh, other people's lives, what other people have? How God has shown his generosity to them? Do you ever... Does that ever make you feel resentment towards God? Because he's not given those things to you. Does your life seem tough? Do you feel like, you know, you have borne the heat of the day? You've been faithful for so long, you see so little in return. Whilst for others, I mean, it just seems like life's a walk in the park for them and everything just seems to fall into place. Brothers and sisters, to envy like that is to lose sight of your denarius. Because you've forgotten. You've forgotten your denarius. It is to allow God's goodness, his generous kindness, his grace, to produce sin in your heart. When his disciples plead the case for their hardship, you know, what, what of us? We've given up so much for you, Jesus. We've left everything to follow you. Jesus reminds them, says this in chapter 19, verse 28, Truly I tell you, 
at the renewal of all things, when the Son of Man sits on his glorious throne, everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and inherit eternal life. You see, no one enters God's kingdom on the basis of what they have achieved and no one is more worthy on account of how hard they've worked. In fact, the only basis upon which one enters God's kingdom is on the basis of what he wants, of what he chooses. Look carefully at verse 15. The landowner declares, don't I have the right to do what I want? And that is why Jesus says that in his kingdom, verse 16, and this is the key really to it all, that's why it tops and tails the story. The last will be first, and the first will be last. That's a strange statement, isn't it? Sort of an enigmatic statement, it sounds like to us. How can it be? What does it look like? Actually, you know, when, it, when, it, when, when, you, when, you, when you get it, it's just so obvious, actually. Where, how can you have a result where the first are last, where at the same time, the last are first? It's actually really simple. It's when everyone crosses the line at exactly the same time. It's photo finish, isn't it? Every foot right over the line, exactly the same point. And that's the point. Do you see? You and I are called to run a good race, to run like a focused athlete. Remove all the encumbrances. Fix your gaze on the ribbon. Picture the medal, and it's a medal you will receive. And then run whatever distance God has set for you, whether it's uphill or downhill, cold or heat, whatever. See, the Christian life is a life that is all of grace. It's all of God's undeserved generosity. Everything's done for us. Yet there is a race to run. The denarius is in the bag. But joyfully, there is work. There is work to done. There's a race to be run. That's how we live. And so the big question really for you and I, if we're followers of Christ, is, is simply, will you run? Will you run the race? And will you hold up empty hands to him? And trust that he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Grace. Father, we thank you for your amazing grace. We thank you that Jesus Christ has paid for our salvation. That it doesn't depend on our efforts or our dedication. It all depends on your grace. And so we thank you that you are such a generous, such a kind, such a good God. Help us, we pray, to live lives that are worthy of the calling that we've received. To run that race with all of our strength and for all of your glory. For we ask this in your name. Amen.